afternoon. I'm Joanne Kennan. I'm the editor at large for healthcare at Politico, and I'm their moderator today. The, today's forum is presented jointly with the Forum, Politico, and the Commonwealth Fund. Joining me today, Bob Blendon, the Richard L. Menschel Professor of Public Health and Professor of Health Policy and Political Analysis Emeritus at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And personally, also someone I have learned a great deal about health and health politics over the years. David King is a senior lecturer in public policy at Harvard Kennedy School and faculty chair of Harvard's bipartisan program for newly elected members of the US Congress. Sabrina Corlett, research professor, founder, and co-director of the Center on Health Insurance Reforms and the McCord School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. And Sabrina is another person I've known for a long time as she used to work on the Hill where I covered healthcare. Um, and Guy Oriel Charles is the Edward and Ellen Schwartzman Professor of Law at Duke University School of Law, co-director of the Duke Law Center on Law, Race, and Politics. That's a title that's about to become obsolete as he joins Harvard Law School next fall. He is also a member of President Biden's new commission on the future of the Supreme Court, but we're not allowed to ask him about that. And they haven't met yet anyway, so eventually we'll hear about it. We're live streaming on the website of the forum, on Facebook, on YouTube, and viewers can submit questions via email to the forum at HSPH, Harvard School of Public Health, the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. I will probably be able to work in some of the questions as we move forward, and then we have some time at the end, we'll take them. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how this is going to work. Um, Bob is gonna start us off in a minute or two and with an overview and some data and polling. Then each speaker is gonna give us a tackle a topic for us and lay out the land. And then we'll come back and talk about some of these topics that come up in more depth, and we will end up with audience questions. Um, the United States, as we all know, has a Democratic president, a Democratic controlled Congress, although barely, you know, the Senate is 50 50 and the House is very close, and a conservative Supreme Court. And that'll be true for a while. Analysis of public opinion on a range of issues shows really deep divides between, between Democrats and Republicans. It's getting wider, not narrower. At the same time, we're in a global pandemic. Health policy, racial justice, health care, disparities, they are all intertwined. All these issues that our country is pretty much struggling with or tearing itself apart over are linked, and we will be touching on many of them today. Um, how will the divisions among the parties play out? How will divisions within the parties play out? Because both sides have their own different camps. Um, before we begin, we're going to watch a very short news clip from March 11th from President Biden talking about the COVID relief bill. The clip is shown courtesy of Politico. I'd get in trouble if I forgot to say that part. So go ahead with the video, please. Look, we know what we need to do to beat this virus. Tell the truth. Follow the scientists and the science. Work together. Put trust and faith in our government to fulfill its most important function, which is protecting the American people. No function more important. We need to remember the government isn't some foreign force in a distant capital. No, it's us, all of us. We the people. For you and I, that America thrives when we give our hearts, when we turn our hands to common purpose. And right now, my friends, we're doing just that. And I have to say, as your president, I'm grateful to you. So President Biden ran on a message of unity. He is trying to govern on a message of unity. Bob is going to talk in, in one second about what we know about unity and disunity. But I, there was really an interesting um, top of playbook today, political playbook today, talking about partisanship and talking about the sort of narrative is that we can't find it, right? And they quote some Republicans saying that there are some Republicans who want to deal and they're having trouble getting that across. Um, that the narrative we're hearing about impossibility may not be the true narrative. And there's a frustrated Republican staffer. Of course, he has his own point to make, but I, I just want to share the quote. This is from one of the Republican staffers from the, the group of 10 that has gone to the White House and come out. You know, they haven't had any deals. Um, the quote is, everything they support is defined, everything they, referring to the Democrats, everything they support is defined as either COVID relief or infrastructure. And everything they oppose is like 
Jim Crow voter suppression and evil, this aide said. And you constantly feel like you're in this gaslighting chamber of insanity, but it's working. So um, we'll come back to what does bipartisan look like, but let's start with Bob. Um, what are you seeing? Is this a myth? Have we, are you ever gonna see it again in our lifetime? Uh, so I would never answer that question, <laughs> but uh, what it, I wanna be helpful for in the discussion afterwards is a quick weather forecast looking at just the environment that we'll have over the next year, next year and a half. Uh, and then I want to help viewers uh, do something where they can do their own weather forecast. This will only take a second. Uh, when I grew up, uh, you believe that public opinion is what the Congress voted on. And in the last 15 years, this has declined dramatically. What does it reflect what the Congress votes on uh, is the view of the majority of people who identify with the majority party. So quick example, people don't remember, the majority of the public did not want the ACA. Uh, majority of Democrats didn't, it was enacted. In 2017, the majority of Americans did not want President Trump's tax act. Majority of Republicans did, it was enacted. The New York Times refused to cover this, uh, but in the recent COVID-19 relief uh, bill, uh, in the polls, overwhelming public support, except it was supposed by Republicans. Uh, and there was not a single Republican vote in the Senate. And so if I wanna do my own weather forecast thing, I have to look at what the majority is, in this case, the houses are very close uh, stand. And so I'm gonna show you that very quickly, but I need to add one other factor uh, to environment. The Democrats today are not the Democrats uh, of yesteryear. They, uh, those of you who saw a little more gray hair, Bill Clinton spoke his first talk and he said, the era of big government is over. Sorry, the current Democrats absolutely have a list of issues. Top priority, I want federal intervention. I want something done. Don't tell me we have limits. And also on no list can you find the word deficit on the Democratic side. And they're willing to raise taxes on corporations and they're willing to raise taxes on very wealthy people. This is a different democratic era. We're gonna take a look very quickly uh, at the issues, but this is, uh, what are your top three priorities? They give you 20. Uh, what do you want the federal government to do big? Uh, and so that is gonna play out on these ver various issues. So I just wanna look at a few very quickly because it'll help you deal with the newspaper about what actually happens versus what the talk is all about. So let's go with the fir uh, 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 this first slide and we'll do this very quickly. So I want to look at, uh, again, President uh, Biden's very powerful talk on COVID-19. So who should be responsible for dealing with this? Well, Democrats quite overwhelmingly, Washington. Republicans quite o overwhelmingly, uh, states. And there are 26 Republican governors. And if you follow the news, each one of them is willing to take this on by themselves. Uh, uh, for that. And then uh, uh, back to again, President Biden's statement, Democrats have substantially more confidence in medical scientists than do Republicans. So it's not surprising you go from President Trump who avoided being seen with medical scientists to President Biden every day saying, I am surrounded by medical scientists and they're gonna make these decisions. There's a totally different view within the parties about that issue. Uh, let's take a, oh, and one other issue, just if you want to pick up the news and just know how it is, Republicans are against lockdowns, close down school closings. And in general, to pull a governor's arm, no. Democrats are willing to close down in, uh, in states. They're willing to hold up on uh, schools going back. And this goes on over and, and over. So you just tell me the state and I'll tell you uh, what it is. Uh, let's take a quick look at national health insurance uh, and the universal coverage debates. Next slide. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, you can see very quickly, uh, the two parties have a different view of what federal government should do in healthcare. It's overwhelmingly intervening in the Democratic side uh, and absolutely not on the Republican side. In fact, the majority of Republicans think government is too much involved in the healthcare system. So any piece of legislation that has 50 new ways federal government will be involved will get overwhelming Democratic support, 
but you'll find those 12 senators coming to the White House having trouble uh, uh, signing off on that. Uh, I want to, uh, let's deal with health system, ref uh, uh, one more on the national health insurance and I want to talk about health system reform. Next slide. Uh, so uh, let's get this straight. The Democrats that put President Biden in want everybody to have a health insurance policy. It's the top of their charts. Make sure they do it. There is no interest uh, on the Republican side of, of moving further with this. But let me make this clear. People can quote me all over. Repeal of the ACA is over. There will be no. Uh, not only do the Democrats have the majority, that is old new. So the ACA might evolve someday, but the repeal issue is over. But Democrats want to get everybody covered. That is going to be a high priority with this administration. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so this is the simplest thing, uh, but it's often misinterpreted. Uh, in the future, what do you want the health system to look like? Uh, mostly based on private insurance, uh, mostly based and run by the government. Uh, Republicans want a private insurance world. Uh, Democrats, where it's misunderstood is half of Democrats that say run by mostly by government mean government regulation. They do not mean government ownership. The other half of Democrats uh, 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 favor a, a Medicare for all type plan. So if you look at no interest on the Republican side, you just see debates about fixing the ACA but adding Medicare. Uh, but uh, uh, that's where the Democrats divide. But they are not interested in a private alone uh, system. Now, I want to make a quick point, and people uh, will remember this. Uh, most Democrats like to talk about fixing, regulating the whole health care system. It's a disaster. Quickly, let me tell you something that just happened in, in a year and a half ago. Basically, public confidence in the Medicare system, in the medical care system, has dramatically gone up among Democrats and Republicans. Let me put this as simple as possible for you. Uh, the business is closed. The schools closed. Teachers won't go back to work. Uh, government agencies rolled back. Who stayed open? Doctors, hospitals, and nurses. And I have to tell you, looking at polls, people are incredibly grateful. So the idea that we're going to regulate change, make sure that this happens, it is off the table. The one issue that shows up over and over, it, it's just random. Do something about pharmaceutical prices. Do something about pharmaceutical. And it's a Republican and Democrat. Do something. But the rest of the system is going to wait. Uh, last uh, slide, last issue, and th then uh, we move on. Uh, you have to go back to the late 1960s to find for on the Democratic side the priority on dealing with racism in our society. It is overwhelming. It's not just another carry on of 10 years. It is overwhelming. In the exit polls, 38% of President Biden's voters said their top issue was dealing with racism in America. It was 3% for President Trump. And so uh, let's just look at this very, very quickly. Racism is a big problem. There is one big party difference. And it's not only a big problem, the Democrats, they push it at the top of every poll. Do something about this uh, issue. You see the party difference here uh, on uh, whether or not there are disparities in how people are treated by the medical care system. And by the way, this has been news in the last two weeks. Uh, uh, between Democrats and Republicans. Democrats believe the care is not the same in many cases. There is discrimination. Republicans just don't see it. Uh, so let me just wrap this up and, and turn it over. There is no evidence from polls that we have left a, a world and entered bipartisan. I cannot find it. Nobody being interviewed raises their hand and says, I'm bipartisan now, Professor, please check a box. They're not. Uh, uh, and on the other side, Democrats have a sense of activism we haven't measured in years uh, for that. So I have no idea how this would play out in the Congress, the courts, everything else, but that's sort of the background information. But the important thing to take away is we didn't end politicalization by this election. It's there. And the question is, how do all these issues play out? Okay, so that sets the stage for us. Um Political and Harvard do some polling together in public health. And when I looked at that poll on, you know, which the state or the federal government responsible, the party split 
um, for the for the pandemic, it, it reminded me of the findings on opioids. Remember, you know, the Democrats, everybody wanted the government to do opioids. It was a bipartisan concern, but Republicans wanted the states to fix it, and the Democrats wanted the the federal government to step up. And maybe that's a dynamic in public health that we're going to have to navigate over in the coming years. Um, David, um, you have been working in a bipartisan space with new members of Congress. Um, Bob doesn't see, uh, he, he sees gridlock as far as the eye, as his eyes go, that not that he's making it up, that's what the years of polling experience are telling him. Is it, uh, I mean, I live in Washington, it's pretty bad right now. What are you seeing in, in your work and uh, can, can Biden do what he wants or is it just gonna be limited to what he can get through with Democrats only? Uh, well, it'll be limited to what he can get through with Democrats only, plus executive orders, plus signing statements. You know, uh, I, we keep hearing about gridlock, but I think we should begin talking about living off the grid. Because from the point of view of the president, he needs to work around Congress whenever and however he possibly can, even though he's a creature of that environment. But the, the level of... Um, uh, animosity in the House and the Senate right now is just staggering. I was speaking with a brand new member uh, end of last week in the evening, and she said that she has yet, this is a Democrat, she's yet to meet a freshman Republican face-to-face. -face. Not even, I mean, they've seen each other on Zoom, but they there's no connective tissue here. Um, the good news, this is about public health and public health is one of those broad issues right now that is holistic and it is a solution. If we think about uh, politics in Washington as a division between problems that kind of bubble up and people say, oh my God, solve this, solve this. Public health has often been on that, oh my God, help us. We, we need solutions out there. But public health actually is the solution for, you know, education, infrastructure, a healthy economy. And, and to the extent that public health can shift in that direction, uh, you'll find that it's one of the three big successful themes moving forward in the 117th, which would of course be climate change and resiliency. That's gonna be a big umbrella theme. Energy is going to be a big umbrella theme and, and certainly public health writ large. Everything right now should be marketed, I think, from the School of Public Health. Your answer should be, that's us, you know? <laughs> well, I, we can do that, that's us. Um, the, other, the other, in terms of actual legislative action, um, and this is, you know, this is, I guess, Sabrina's uh, area, but I just wanna say, you know, that, that you're right, Bob, uh, uh, the ACA's with us, it's not going anywhere. And um, there's support for incremental changes like right now and not just a full public option, but that's where we can see some, some things take place. We can get into the weeds later on about the procedural things that might have to happen within the rules to get some of these things done, but think not only outside the box, but think off the grid. Sabrina, that's a perfect entry point for you. Um, you know, we just saw the ACA survive four years of pretty much constant assault under the Trump administration and the Republican Senate. Um, the uninsurance rate did um, lose ground. I mean, more people lost coverage during the Trump years, but not cataclysmic numbers. I mean, they didn't, un the ACA muddled through. Um, and now we're seeing new opportunities, like special enrollment, extended enrollment, some new, uh, we'll let you describe what, what the president got through the reconciliation bill. Um, you know, where are we in terms of coverage 10 years, 10 years now, more than 10 years, 11, I guess, um, since passage of the ACA in the worst public health crisis and, you know, economic disaster? Um, how much of a safety net was it? What do we need to do about the ACA? What can we do in the current environment? And, and just mention what, what the Democrats just did and why it only lasts for two years. <laughs> Yeah, we thank you, Joanne. Some of that, right. With some of that. Yeah, um, I mean, to. certainly, uh, as David noted, I think the COVID-19 pandemic has um, exposed the primacy of, our, of public health and our, the need for um, a focus on public health. But it also uh, underlined the, the concern about our healthcare safety net. 
Um, the good news is that um, we're lucky that this pandemic hit now and not 10 years ago before the Affordable Care Act was enacted, um, because even though we did see 3 million people last year lose employer-based insurance, um, thanks to all of the economic fallout of the pandemic, um, we actually saw most of those people land fairly safely in Medicaid or a marketplace health plan. So we did not see the big spikes in uninsurance that at least some economists predicted at the start of the pandemic. But as you mentioned, Joanne, you know, there are still big gaps. And um, we did see erosion in insurance rates under the Trump administration. In fact, um, uninsurance dropped about 14% between 2016, 2016 and 2019. With um, Latinos being a big, uh, one of the really hard hit area for complicated reasons also having to do with immigration. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the good news is that, um, you know, the Biden administration is coming in, they've promised to build on the Affordable Care Act and expand the role of government through this public option plan. And they've already achieved at least part of that commitment through this American Rescue Plan Act or COVID relief bill that was passed last month. Um, and that bill includes expansions in the um, subsidies that are available for the ACA plans, but also new incentives for states to expand their Medicaid programs. Um, the hitches, as you noted, they're temporary, um, it's temporary relief, um, only two years. And, um, and then also the financial incentives that were sort of dangled out there for these states that haven't yet expanded Medicaid, there's as yet, no clear sense that those states are gonna take up this, this offer. Um, so I do think that going forward, um, both the Biden administration and the Congress are gonna be under some considerable pressure to make these subsidies permanent, um, figure out what we're gonna do about these people who still fall through the cracks, either they're below the poverty line in states that, that haven't or won't expand Medicaid, or they just don't qualify for the ACA coverage for another reason. Um, I, I, you know, the tricky bit, of course, is that, um, you know, as folks have noted, we've got this very narrow uh, Democratic majority in Congress. And also, and I think uh, Professor Charles will talk about this, we've got litigants out there who will jump at the opportunity to sue over any potential expansion of the Affordable Care Act. So this is a very tricky needle to thread, um, but I'm looking forward to our conversation today to figure out how, um, how any of this can be accomplished. Hey, the, we live in an era where all policy ends up in the courts, just about, right? I mean, 10 or 20 years ago, a lot of it did, but now everything does. And the fact that um, this is, it's become an extension of the legislative process. You lose in Congress, you fight it out in the court. It's almost like, I mean, the court is the court, it's not writing laws, but the legislative process has an extra step. I mean, we're, we're, we're waiting for a ruling, the third, the third big, you know, potentially existential threat to the ACA. We all, I mean, the justices were unusually blunt in their oral arguments that they, you know, probably not gonna throw out the whole ACA. We never know until we see it, but that's three, hopefully the last, I'm tired of covering it. Um, but every little thing, environment, I mean, I don't mean little as in um, the topic is little, but every rule, every reg, there's, there's a legal fight. What is, how is this changing the role of the Supreme Court? And, you know, what are we going to see? Is, and is it as predictable? I mean, people say, ah, oh, 6-3, we know everything is going to happen. We know how it's going to turn out. Is that, are we still confident? Well, so Joanne, you'll recall, I'm sure, the old Alexis de Tocqueville quote that there is hardly a political question in the United States, which does not sooner or later turn into a judicial one. Um, and you're exactly right. In many respects, what we have are all of the major questions and issues in American democratic politics eventually make their way to the court. I mean, you saw this recently with the election, but you also saw it with the um, state COVID orders. Um, all, all, all of these questions get litigated 
and many of them make their way to the Supreme Court. Um, and like all the other institutions um, that we've been talking about, starting with Bob's wonderful description, the court too is divided. Um, and you might think of it as divided in sort of three categories where you have essentially the left being anchored by Justice Sotomayor and then Kagan and Breyer, the right, uh, Justices Thomas and Alito, and then the center right, um, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Chief Justice Roberts. And of course, uh, the replacement of Justice Ginsburg made uh, by, by Justice Barrett made a difference by moving the court um, a bit to the right on most of these issues, including um, uh, healthcare issues. So you wonder, uh, this is a court that upheld the individual mandate in 2012 on tax grounds with the Chief Justice um, joining the liberals and the chief justice has just much less power now with a 6-3 court. So, um, so clearly the divisions that we have in American politics um, exist in some way, not in the same way, but in some way on the court with um, major public policy questions going to the court. It's not going to be quite as predictable. I think, I think there will be some predictability, um, but not quite as predictable. Uh, part of it will uh, you know, obviously depend on the three justices in the center right. Um, Chief Justice Roberts, um, and then you know, can he get um, Justice either Kavanaugh or Gorsuch to go along with them? And sometimes they've been willing to join the liberals on the court to make the court less predictable. Uh, and that's what we will be looking for on some of these major, major questions. As you said, if, you're, if we're reading the tea leaves correctly in the oral arguments, it seems really, um, it seems that the court will, uh, will strike down the uh, individual mandate, um, but then not the whole ACA. Um, so again, this is again where some of the justices and, and so the center right um, are likely to join with the justices on, on the left. So then you have less predictability on the basis of partisanship or ideology on the court than you might otherwise if you're simply looking at um, the partisanship or ideology of the justices. And, and so that's one of the major questions is the fact that all of these issues, voting rights questions, Biden's racial justice, Bob talked about that as a major issue for the Democrats, um, all of these things are likely in, at some point or another to end up before the, uh, a divided court and a court in which the chief justice is going to have to figure out how he can maneuver to make the perception of the court as predictable and partisanship less so. Justice Breyer gave a major um, um, address recently saying that the court is not that partisan, that the court is not that political. And I think that's the question that the justices on the court are going to have to think through. And we've, before we go move on to sort of the more interactive part, I, I do want to just ask you one more question because we have a, an extraordinary spate of voting rights laws uh, going through state legislatures that I expect will end up in the court. Um, they are, um, I think some people have been surprised at the breadth and what they would do to voting rights in some of these states. Um, how, how, I mean, what are you... That's going to end up the court. Will it be before 2022? Or we don't know. I mean, will the next, will the, will the House races be shaped by these? Will we know how the Supreme Court is going to treat them? And what, given the Supreme Court struck down some, a portion of the Voting Rights Act, what, I forgot how many years ago, but uh, Chief, Justice Roger, Chief Justice Roberts voted against it. I mean, we've also seen things happen that maybe some of the justices who, didn't anticipate would happen in real life, right? I mean, we've seen um, some extraordinary things in our elections <laughs> in the last yeah. couple of years. Um, just speak a little bit about that landscape because it's really pretty, voting is pretty crucial. Yeah, so there are two things to, to think about. So the first is um, similar to what you saw from Bob's slides on healthcare and the government. So there is both an ideological divide and then a racial problem. Um, so the ideological divide is that for the most part, Democrats want universal voting or as universally as possible. Um, and Republicans want to restrict voting to people who they believe are, are entitled to that right. So they're worried about voter fraud and Democrats 
Democrats are generally worried about access. Then um, you layer that upon the ra the racial worry, which is that there are some um, states. North Carolina is is an example. The recent Georgia um, bill is an example in which it seems that. Um, Republican legislators are attempting to craft voting rules in a way that undermines the voting power of particular groups, including um, African Americans. So when it came to redistricting and when it came to the voting rights laws in North Carolina, a, a federal court found that the court that the state legislature crafted that rule with particular precision to undermine the voting power of black voters in the state of North Carolina. Uh, and so the worry that you're seeing across a number of different states, uh, you're seeing both the partisanship and the racial worry that when uh, voters of color exercise their voting rights in a particular way, whether it's Sunday voting or um, absentee balloting or whatever the mechanism is, there seems to be a response by states. And those are generally states controlled by Republicans that then pass or attempt to pass voting rules that undermine that power. And so now we have before Congress a major omnibus voting bill. And it's not just about voting rights. It also is about campaign finance and ethics. And the question is, if that passes, and that's a big question politically, whether it will be passed, then how will it fare before a court? Will the court defer to Congress or will the court uh, impose its own views on this voting bill. And again, this is another area of uncertainty that we're waiting to see what happens both in the political process and then also what happens before the courts. It's someday that's the memoir I wanna read from John Roberts <laughs> about how his views on voting may have changed um, as he, I mean, I, I, it would be really interesting to know he voted a certain way, our country looked one way, our country looks a different way. Now it'll be a really interesting, um, well, I mean, who knows what they'll do and when they'll do it, but it, it's going to be interesting to see. Um, thank you for the insights. We're going to go sort of deep dive into a few of these topics a little bit more. Um, before I do, uh, I want to remind everybody that this is the forum at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. It is presented jointly by the school, political and the Commonwealth Fund. Um, reminder, you can send in your questions, the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. We have another clip right now about the infrastructure bill from President Biden. This too, I have to remind you that it is from Politico. Here's the truth. We all will do better when we all do well. It's time to build our economy from the bottom up and from the middle out, not the top down. That hadn't worked very well. For the economy overall, it hadn't worked. Because Wall Street didn't build this country. You, great middle class, built this country. And unions built the middle class. And it's time, <clears throat> and this time, when we rebuild the middle class, we're going to bring everybody along. Regardless of your background, your color, your religion, no matter, everybody gets to come along. Infrastructure. Okay, we've had a joke in the press and all of Washington for four years that it was Infrastructure Week. Really, it is Infrastructure Week. Only the week might last about six months. Um, there's a funny, you know, a couple, you know, at the very beginning of the Biden administration, Bob and I were working on a poll, talking about a poll. We were talking, are things going to be bipartisan or is it going to be reconciliation for the first package? And we noted that the last package in the Trump administration was bipartisan. So it took forever. It took until December. States needed the money, but it was very bipartisan at the end. And, you know, Bob and I both felt it's likely to end up partisan just because we knew the dynamic. But neither one of us, or at least I wasn't willing to say it, on January 20th that there's no bipartisanship. You know, maybe I was wrong, but I wasn't willing to say this cannot be bipartisan. It's, there's no way. Um, as we know, that first large one point, almost two trillion dollar bill was Democrats only. Democrats and Republicans agree on bipartisanship. There's no pro-collapsing bridge caucus, but they don't agree on the definition of what is infrastructure or whether it is only the collapsing bridges, the potholes, the, the, the narrow definition of infrastructure. Um, so let's, let's, David, I mean, explain what reconciliation is because you know, in the normal, in the rest of the world, reconciliation means people making up, and in the Senate, it means people going to war. Um, so, so first, briefly explain infrastructure. Excuse me. Briefly, talk a little bit about the prospect for bipartisanship and in infrastructure. I mean, are these ten Republicans 
you know, out in the wilderness saying they're being gaslit? Are they going to come forth and do something? Or is that, are they gaslighting the gaslighters? Um, explain briefly to anyone who doesn't know what reconciliation uh, is. It is this crazy thing. <laughs> so and let's do the, the quick numbers game, of course, is that there are 50 and 50, right? 50 D's, 50 R's in the Senate. If you manage to get something past the House, even though it's a narrow majority in there, you move into the Senate. And so with the vice president casting the tie, bow, tie vote, you should be able to win 51 to 50 if you stay along party lines. But there's a whole world out there in which people can have holds on legislation. We generally think about it as a filibuster. It's not quite how we ought to think about it, but there's this large, now you have to get over 60 votes, right? If you're gonna, if you're gonna avoid the process of the filibuster. So can you get 10 Republicans to agree with the Democrats? Yes, that is what we should be doing on infrastructure. Um, well, with the bill as it's currently designed, no way, because it's massive and they've thrown everything they could possibly put into that piece of legislation. Much of it is gonna get burned out anyway, eventually, but it is, um, it is, unlikely to lead to a bipartisan solution. So if the Republicans, if the Democrats are gonna move forward, they'll have to do it through reconciliation. Uh, and the process of reconciliation is basically you're trying to balance your books and you can have a special bill just to try and balance the budget books in a budget within a year. You have to reconcile the numbers when, once the things are coming through. You can only do it once per fiscal year. Um, and that bill doesn't need 60 votes. If you're operating under reconciliation, it's a specific kind of bill, then if you can get 50 votes, you do it. So the $1.9 trillion jobs bill, you know, COVID relief bill went through reconciliation. Can the Democrats do it again? You can only do it once per fiscal year. But the fiscal year that they did the last one in a couple months ago was the last was the fiscal year we're currently in. We're now moving into another fiscal year. The federal fiscal year runs um, October 1st through, unlike the state fiscal years. Um, so there's a part of the Budget Empowerment and Control Act of 1974, one of all of our favorites, I'm sure. Please read it. And Section 302 does allow for the possibility of having reconciliation through that it might be able to happen again. Gosh, this is awfully inside the we inside uh, baseball. Um, uh, things will then depend on what the Senate parliamentarian thinks. She's fabulous, but she's a, a stickler to the rules. It'll be interesting to see. Um, I don't think we're going to see any kind of wellspring of bipartisanship. I don't think there are 10 easy votes or even uh, there aren't. I can't imagine 10 Republicans coming over to do this infrastructure bill. The short term is they're going to have to get infrastructure through a reconciliation process. The longer term solution is probably going to be convincing Joe Manchin to back down on some aspects of the breaks around uh, filibusters. I think we should point out, too, that these very complicated reconciliation rules, and I covered the Congress for I don't know, 12 years or so, and I couldn't totally explain them to you accurately um, on more than a sort of very superficial level, Sabrina lived with them. Um, but they, they have to be budgetary. They're, they're not like the Voting Rights Act, the, the voting issues, um, my understanding cannot, that's a 60 vote issue that cannot go through reconciliation, correct? And other sort of- uh, Yeah, there has to be a clear budget, a budgetary impact for it to be considered um, part of a budget reconciliation package, which is, which is actually why um, the minimum wage wasn't allowed to go through in the jobs bill. Uh, but does how does that I mean, on one hand, we're going to have two, possibly three reconciliation bills in, a two, in two calendar years or two legislative seasons, because it's just weird. Um, the fiscal year never coincides exactly with the calendar year, but it's even more off kilter this time. So we'll have multiple bites of the reconciliation apple. There are certain things that Democrats and Republicans care about. They care about differently, but voting rights being one of them. Um, if on one hand you can get a lot of things through with 51 votes, then you don't have to blow up the filibuster to get that. Where does the voting rights issue fit in in the politics of changing the filibuster? Um, because for infrastructure, you don't need to get uh, the it, filibuster. It, it, it's right. center, right? HR1 uh, is absolutely the best case that the Democrats can make that they need to uh, 
get rid of the current filibuster rule. Absolutely. That's it. Okay. Sabrina, um, ACA, as we mentioned, there were some fixes made, the first expansion ever, the first significant expansion in, in, in the last reconciliation bill. You now have a tug of war um, in the Democratic Party about what else to do. Um, the, Nancy Pelosi wants to do more ACA building. Bernie Sanders wants to do more Medicare, uh, lower the Medicare age and eligibility. Um, pretty much all the Democrats or most of the Democrats want to go back to that two year subsidy and, and make it permanent or at least make it if they can't get it permanent, get it 10 years, whatever, we'll push it out there so it doesn't go away in two years. It is very hard for Republicans to go to take something away from people. There are very few precedents for taking away a benefit. They failed to repeal the Affordable Care Act when they had controlled all branches of government. Um, there's also the public option, you know, is it going to be a big pub? Biden campaigned on it. Um, but what's it going to look like? When is it going to look? I've, I've heard they may do an itsy bitsy one that gets to the Medicaid. I mean, that, that some, there's discussion about um, doing a little one that lets you put a down payment politically, say we've started this process as promised, but that in the real impact at first would just be to cover the two or three million people left out in the Medicaid expansion states. So, and that would be potentially a reconciliation topic. Um, when you think about the debate going on in the Democratic Party right now, um, you certainly have, I think, as, as Bob Slide suggested, really strong consensus about universal coverage. Um, but maybe not so much consensus about how we get there. And I do think it's really important because often the concept of universal coverage and single payer, those two concepts often get conflated, but I think they're very distinct and different. So take, for example, Massachusetts, right? Massachusetts has pretty darn close to universal coverage. They have a 2.8% uninsured rate. That's like as good as it gets, I think, really. Um, but they don't have single payer. In fact, they were the model for Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, right? So it's certainly possible to get to universal coverage by building on the ACA. And I think that's the kind of argument you're seeing from Pelosi and others. Um, and, and I think something the Biden administration campaigned on. Um, so um, there are, of course, still gaps. Um, you have these Medicaid, uh, these states that will not, uh, maybe even with big financial carrots, ever expand Medicaid. Um, and then you have folks that the ACA just sort of shut out. Um, for example, people who are undocumented immigrants. Um, but I think it is possible to get to universal coverage using the ACA framework. Um, where a public option, I think, could really be um, useful uh, is, you know, for example, in those parts of the country where there's just not affordable coverage options, either uh, in the marketplace or because a state hasn't expanded Medicaid, um, or um, just in general to keep overall costs down. Um, but I have to say, you know, if you, even if you could get a public option done through reconciliation, which is a big fat if, um, I don't know that there's 50 votes for that. And, and you know, David, you may have um, other ideas, but going back to Bob's earlier point about the goodwill of the public towards providers, hospitals, doctors, the way the public option works and the way it's affordable is it cuts reimbursement for those providers. So I, I just don't see there being a political appetite to gore that ox right now. Maybe pharma, but not everybody else, right? Drug prices are still an issue for people. Yeah, and in and, and Washington state, which does have a public option, um, went to effect this year, I believe for the first time, it, it, when they, the, the rates they started talking about are not the rates they ended up. It's, it's a multiple of Medicare or a percentage of Medicare. Uh, yeah, more than that's Medicare. right. And they, they, they ended up paying a lot more than they thought really they were going to. Right. Cut provider rates that much. And so they didn't get the premium savings that they had hoped for. Right. Um, there's one Medicaid issue, um, which has been important to Republicans for many years, which is work requirements. Um, the courts stopped them. But it's and the Biden administration is unwinding those waivers and telling states they can't do them. Nevertheless, it's still going to the Supreme Court. As far as we know, it's still the, the Biden administration has a different position than the Trump administration. Um, it, it's sort of moot in the sense that the Biden administration is not going to let it happen now. But Guy, can you sort of explain why um, 
it's important for the future, why the court will still take up a Trump policy that Biden has repudiated. Why is that still in the court? Sure. So, um, so the, the question is, basically is, to what extent do we expect the policy to go into effect even if the position of the federal government has changed. I mean, so the ACA is a, is a pretty good example on that, um, where the Biden administration's position is that the individual mandate is constitutional um, and the policy is still a very much a, very, a, a live one. Um, it is um, an effect, the government wants to enforce it. Uh, and so even though the prior administration have changed and even though prior administration may have taken one position and now the federal government is taking, taking a, a very different position, as long as there's still a live question and a live issue that there's something for the court to decide uh, that's going to affect the rights of, of people, um, it does, you know, have some impact with respect to the, the, the position of the administration, but it is not often determinative. Uh, and so I think um, given um, the, uh, the there's the issues not going to be moot or given that it is still a live constitutional question, um, then the position of the Biden administration, yes, it, it matters, uh, but it is not determinative in, in, in certain sets of cases. Because the conservative states know that Biden will not be president forever, we will not have a democratic president forever, and that this could potentially allow them to do this under a future president. Well, yeah, very, very much so. I mean, the issue is still very much the same. A different president, a different administration might might take a different um, position on on the question on the issue. You know, it depends on. We have to look at these issue by issue, but on on most of these issues, these questions will remain the same. And uh, I want to ask you a question, Guy, and I want David to also weigh in on this. We've been talking a lot about legislation and reconciliation. We are also living in an era of executive orders. It's not just Biden. It's not just Trump and Obama. I mean, we've seen more and more executive orders over the years. Um, they, too, end up in court. Um, is, is that something? And we've, we've just seen one on guns, which, you know, you could only go so Biden can only go so far on guns. He also needs legislation, which is. We, we've watched for decades that difficult to pass. Um, is, is, do the courts regard EOs differently than they regard legislation or, or it just, it's, it's no, a form of the, law? For the most part, they are, they're law. Um, now, one question that one could think about, and this is a question that we think about in the context of the of executive orders, is the power of the presidency, um, especially in an era in which um, Congress is not passing as much as this legislation as, as we might expect them to, given their institutional role. So you might think about this as a separation of powers problem, um, a checks and balances problem, that you're supposed to have these branches that are supposed to check uh, one another and that the executive um, has limited sets of powers. But of course, the political process, and in this case, the Biden administration comes in, um, people are expecting it to do something. Obviously, the Democrats have some control, but not full and, and complete control. Um, and so for the courts, it's, it's just looking at legislation, um, what the federal government is doing. But one worry that we might have to think about is what is, is the executive branch getting um, too strong, but they're going to look at this in the same traditional way they look at it. Is there a statute uh, does, or does the constitution authorizes the president to do what it is that, that he's doing in whatever particular case that we're looking at? Yeah, I, you know, this, there's this interesting fiction that we have a balance of powers and we don't, we have constant conflict over power. The uh, Article One powers are, are to Congress and those are to make the laws. And then Article Two powers for the executive branch are to, you know, take care, to take care provision to, that the laws of the land are faithfully executed. So I'm an Article One person. This, if imagine like this is a statute and Congress has passed it, right? Then the president can come along and say, okay, given this poorly designed hard to understand statute. I'm going to issue some executive orders because I have to take care that they're faithfully executed, right? And, and, and I'm going to detail what we need to do. If Congress continues writing legislation that's all floppy and ill-defined, the executive branch has some real wiggle room there. Um, and right now, you know, what, is, what's, what, what, does, what else can Biden do? Right? He's not going to get new legislation. Where I do worry, Guy, is that 
over the last four to six years, I think that some of those court interpretations about how close you were to the underlying statute have gotten a little looser. And that, that worries me down the road. Um, um, I've been working in some of the audience questions while we've had this conversation, but I wanna ask uh, one specifically to Bob. Um, one of the, well, somebody asks, are we going to see more, are we gonna see a viable third party because of this um, you know, stalemate we have? And are we gonna see more independent voters? And uh, I know from you that independent voters aren't really so independent, <laughs> but address third party independent voters. Let's try to get a couple of things in pretty quickly because we're running out of time. So quick, it's more on David's side. We've made it incredibly difficult to launch a third party in this country. Uh, the state laws, the regulation, the raising funds, uh, Ross Perot is the end. Uh, so it's very unlikely unless the party collapses uh, uh, for that. Uh, again, when you're in polling, it turns out that uh, most independents lean towards a party and almost vote for them all the time. Then why do they call themselves independents? Because they don't like the party's name. They don't feel good about it. Uh, but it's amazing how many people just continually vote Republican or Democrat. The biggest variable is they turn out the vote uh, uh, for that, but they really are quite leaners. And people say, I'm leaving the Republican Democratic Party. Uh, if you looked at the House vote, they ended up voting for Republicans in the House. So that, that's, that's not uh, 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 likely to happen. Why are things so polarized? And again, this is David's point of view. Uh, but we have placed an emphasis on primaries and how they're run, which is extraordinary. Basically, 20% of adults show up in, in, in a primary on either side. All the polling shows they do not represent America. They do not represent the party. Republicans are as conservative as you can be. Increasingly, on Democrats, they're much more liberal than the party as a whole. And people are running, it, it used to be that, and again, this is my colleagues, other areas, if I got elected in the Congress twice, uh, unless my party lost, it was tenure like universities. But now people are proud, they'll run against you in your own party. And that has made people incredibly sensitive. I can be challenged in my primary. That has contributed to polarization. Yep. Whatever I vote on is going to run when somebody tries to knock me out of office. And if you notice the new Democrats who won on the liberal side, they all knocked out a Democrat. They didn't knock out a Republican for it. So the polarization is coming out of, in fact, independents are not that independent. And the primaries have gotten vicious if you leave the core of your own party. How many swing states do we truly have by 2024, Bob? That's, handful, I, yeah. Hand, just, is it is it all going to come down? I mean, is it like going to be three or four states, and the rest of us should just sort of what, watch Netflix? No, no, it, uh, it it isn't. And well, I'm sure we'll all end on voting. Uh, Georgia was in another category, and it changed American history. So I'm very careful about saying uh, I have a list. These are Republican states. These are swing. These are Democrat. And then I looked at the Georgia results, and I said, Bob, take take that out. You cannot tell. There could and it'll be a depend, in American yeah. history, these states just switch on over. And, and it will also depend the on the thing. voting rights bills. Yes. Oh, yeah. It may depend on that. Um, several people did ask that we ask Guy about um, his views on changing the courts, but it was said at the very beginning, he, is, I don't, he really can't talk about that because he just joined President Biden. If you missed the beginning <laughs> and you put in the question, he is named to the, I want to acknowledge the questions because a few people asked it. He, he has been named to President Biden's commission. They're just starting. He's not allowed to talk about that. So I'm not going to put him on the spot. We will, I'm sure we'll hear plenty about it in six months. Um, another it. question is um, abortion. And, and um, that's not traditionally a reconciliation. I mean, around the edges and certain payment issues, there could be some reconciliation. That's a courts issue. It is the issue that, um, you know, it is that sort of core of our culture war, 6-3 um, court, lots of cases in the pipeline that they have not yet taken. Guy, what do you think we should be looking for in terms of abortion? Yeah, well, ab abortion, I actually think is probably the most central question um, for the court going forward. Um, you now have a court with a very, very solid conservative majority. 
uh, and the expectation uh, is either um, one or two possibilities. One, that the court might continue to nibble at the edges uh, and so hollow the abortion right. Um, and then the other is uh, that people are worried that there will be a full assault on a Roe versus Wade. Um, my guess, if I had to take a guess, but I don't, but I don't really have a crystal ball like like Bob. You know, you, once you start thinking that you can you know, sort of make these guesses, then things happen. Um, so, but if I had to take a guess, I, I guess that the court will continue to to work at the edges. Um, and not uh, confront uh, the question of abortion head on in terms of Roe v. Wade, um, largely because this really is a very polarized country and, and in which um, the court as an institution, people are very much worried about it. And it's hard for me to see the Chief Justice um, allowing that issue to really take over um, the, the, the federal courts and the Supreme Court, but, but that's just a guess. Do you think it would be more that we might see more changes to Casey, which was the undue burden ruling, rather than a specific? You can do a lot in redefining undue burden without abolishing Roe. Is is that where you would see yeah, I mean, more recent, the activity? There's a recent Sixth Circuit case that came that came down two or three days ago um, that um, interprets the undue burden rule in a way that is uh, relatively narrow. Um, so more more than likely that that has been the path that seems to be. Uh, the path than taking on row, it's sort of the, the core row itself, um, or the core right itself. So, so two quick questions, and then you'll all have a chance to wrap up. I want to go back to David and then uh, uh, Bob. Um, but David, who's in charge in Washington? I mean, who are the lobbyists? Who's, who's pulling the levers? And then Bob will let him address, I mean, the pharma issue is one of the few bipartisan issues among voters, and it has been for five or six years now. Republicans okay. and Democrats. First, as, as you know, no one is in charge in Washington and no one is in <laughs> charge of any political party. It's just a collection of people kind of bouncing off of each other. Pharma is, um, has for years now been, you know, one of the major donors. They give D's or R's. It doesn't matter. As long as you're an incumbent, you're going to get flooded with their money. Um, but I, I don't think now is a bad time to be in pharma. I mean, if, you know, you're Moderna, you're Pfizer, you're J&J, you know, they have actually helped to save this country. Uh, I think the weak spot when people talk about prescription prices, what they should be thinking about are the prescription be the prescription benefit managers, right? The, the, you know, the express scripts, the care, care mark and so forth. That, I think, uh, certainly at the state legislative level, after what we saw happening um, to CVS Caremark in Ohio, uh, they are gunning for those prescription benefit man um, managers. And uh, there's a lot of consensus that they're making way too much bank off everybody's back. Bob, are, there, are the uh, pharma, is the drug issue going away or the pharma companies are going to have to spend a lot of lobbying dollars still? Uh, so I think you're going to have to spend a lot uh, for reasons I don't understand. The vaccine did not immunize the industry. Uh, on polls, it's they are incredibly negative. Everybody else is going up. Doctors, nurses, hospitals, uh, not not pharma. They have not gotten the credit on that. The, the biggest party thing, and not take people's time, is Republicans are allergic uh, to price uh, controls. Things are really there. They're really afraid of that. Uh, and so, and Democrats want to have a, a, a price negotiation, which has a certain control side. So they have not reached agreement. That doesn't mean something might not happen. But if you remember, Republicans wanted imports uh, from Canada and from uh, Europe, and Democrats want Medicare getting prices down. But it is an issue that runs in both parties, and that doesn't mean they can find something in the middle. Uh, but they haven't to date, but it's on the top of what uh, uh, candidates are asked. Right. Uh, brief takeaway, Sabrina, I know you've got to go. What, where, where are, what's the, what are, what's the thought you leave here with? Um, well, I, I don't know. I, um, I think I'm actually feeling optimistic. Um, I think, uh, and in, I'm pleased to see Bob saying that there is, um, support still for doing something about pharma prices, because I think that's going to be the pay for for our um, <laughs> expansion of ACA subsidies. So I think we can get it done. David. 
Well, my takeaway is a totally different thing. And that is that I hope people watching here think about getting into office themselves, getting involved locally, running for boards. Uh, if you're into public health, become a public health activist locally. Uh, there are 511,000 elected people in the United States, elected officials, 511,000 of you. So um, it's not just DC, please become more active. Gee, or do we have to all subscribe to Court TV? Is that all we have to watch the next four years? <laughs> you know, my takeaway will be similar to David's. Um, institutions really matter, but people matter as well. Uh, so the courts matter, Congress matters. Uh, but get involved, vote, participate, talk to, talk to your representatives, um, engage as much as, as you possibly can, because that's what changes outcomes. I think I actually managed to finish us up within a minute of our scheduled time, which is an achievement. You're fascinating people. I could sit and talk to you all for like another two hours, but I know you don't have time. Um, it concludes the event. Thank you to everybody. Um, this Q&A has been jointly presented by the Forum at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Politico, and the Commonwealth Fund. We're about to see what the next uh, event is, I believe, and thank you for joining us. I enjoyed it and learned things, and I hope the rest of you did too, and thanks, Bob, always for having me. <laughs>